so that snake like bite a, a soldier who was holding me. And when he was trying to, to rescue himself, I find a way to escape in the forest. And I spent about two, two days in the forest. I mean, one night uh, trying to reach out to the villages. And it was a long way, but, and also a lot of details on the way. But then that's how I escaped from the, the militia. Hey guys, welcome back to When It Hits The Fan, the podcast that delves into what really happens when things go south on the road. Brought to you by Battleface Travel Insurance. If you've never joined us before, we chat with uh, some of the world's most intrepid explorers, journalists, backpackers, travel professionals, and general globetrotters about how they became unstuck on the road and what they did to get out in one piece. But today we've got something a little different. Uh, our guest was certainly on a journey, both literal and metaphorical, but it certainly wasn't for the purposes of recreation. Obed Tuyumvire is the founder of Kumbu Kumbu Tours, uh, a tour company based predominantly around the Virunga National Park in the eastern part of the Democratic Republic of Congo. Obed's childhood was characterized by the uh, bloody conflicts that have in the past marred this part of Africa, and his family was forced to flee Congo when he was only three years old. He spent years in refugee camps in Uganda and Rwanda, and uh, was for a time conscripted as a child soldier as part of a local militia. Obviously, Obed has tons of insights into life as a refugee in this part of the world, and uh, how his own experiences have shaped his overall outlook on life and, of course, the success of his tour company. So, without further ado, let's jump straight into it. Okay, Obed, uh, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, welcome. Um, Obed, you know, I talked at the, the start of this interview and gave a little bit of your, um, your backstory, your, you know, your incredible story in terms of where you've come from. But, you know, in, in terms of, um, I guess, the most formative events of your life, I suppose they start with um, the war that, that led to you becoming a refugee. For, for those people who aren't so aware, can you kind of give a bit of context? What, what were the political reasons for this war? Yeah, uh, the reason of the, the war that's made me a refugee is mostly based on a, on a, a civil war and ethnic uh, connotation wars, you know, that's happening in Africa, mostly in our region. And it's always connected with other countries around, uh, I mean, the neighboring countries uh, to Congo. We have Rwanda, which has struggled also to the from the genocide in 1994. And we have also Burundi, which is not stable now. So those, uh, actually my country was stable from the, the colonial time. It was a kind of uh, a, a metropolitan country. It was, uh, it, it was uh, led by, by a very powerful uh, dictator called Mobutu. So he was kind of very stable in terms of uh, managing the country in the security. And, and where were you a refugee then? First, 1994, we crossed to, to Uganda. We couldn't cross to Rwanda uh, as Rwanda was uh, our neighboring, our nearest neighboring country. We couldn't cross to Rwanda because Rwanda was Rwanda, which was at least stable in the region. And after the war in Rwanda, so we went to, um, we crossed to Rwanda for joining other uh, refugees who came after us. So it was first Uganda, then Rwanda. Right. And, and, and how old yes. were you when you were, you were first displaced? I was three years first. Wow. So you understand that it was, in terms, it was kind of um, periods, different periods. Firstly, the first period was I was three, and then I had to come back to Congo. Then it was random, random going as a refugee, come back, going and come back. You were also, which I wasn't aware of before, but you know, you told me this recently. You were um, also a child soldier then, 
uh, for a certain period of your childhood. From, from what years was this? Ha, that time I was um, ending my primary school because we had to spend four years in a refugee camp, in, first in Uganda, then in Rwanda. And then after the situation tried to be uh, well a bit, so we crossed back to Congo and I had to continue my studies. And then that time I was surprised that school and I was 12 years, uh, between 12 and 13 after my primary school. Then I, ha I was caught at, actually on the way from school and we had to carry the munition from the militia, the, I mean the boxes of bullets, and we were carried in the, in, in, inside the forest. And that was really one of the biggest experiences that I've, me I have uh, survived in, in my life that makes me also strong to understand uh, the current situation that people are struggling all over the world. But when they tell you something, you understand better than anyone because you know, and that from that experience, I understand how far a uh, human being can be weak and uh, bad. And as, as I understand it, you, you actually managed to escape this situation by running into the forest, is that correct? Yeah, that's a very long story, and I'm, I'm actually trying to write a book called, uh, about that. Really? Yeah, it, it was um, a kind of a miracle, let's say, because uh, the soldiers who, were, who took us as, as, a, as their, their, their shell, they were shooting and they were really like uh, enforcing the, us to be closer to them. And when the other side were shooting back, it was like every, anyone, everyone in our, 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 our community, we were taken as a, as a, we were about 10 kids in their, in their environment there. So everyone were trying to find a, a way to escape. So on my side, I, I, I was surprised by, because it was in the world, it was in Virunga National Park. I was surprised by a snake. Actually, animals were, were, were playing and, the birds were flying above us and it was a kind of uh, loss of control and a, a, a kind of uh, a mess. They were a total mess in the forest. So that snake bite a, a soldier who was holding me. And when he was trying to, to rescue himself, I find a way to escape in the forest. And I spent about two, two days in the forest. I mean, one night uh, trying to reach out to the villages. And it was a long way, but, and also a lot of details on the way. But then that's how I escaped from the, the militia. And it, it was this time in the forest, um, I think you said that kind of inspired this, this love of nature and, and this love of the, the natural landscape around you. Is that right? Yeah, that means uh, when we, I grew up, I was born in a, in a village closer to Virunga National Park. And Virunga National Park is one of the, the wildest national parks in Africa. So we have jungles, like deep, deep jungles. So when, whenever I was fleeing, we had to pass through forest, through forest. And um, when I, fle I fled alone at 12, then I find, find myself surrounded by nature, by the world, uh, wildlife. And I had to find a way to get how to to go out from it. And you can imagine two days uh, crossing through the forest, trying to find what to eat. I found that being closer to the forest and being inside the forest, uh, it can be uh, a, a lot of way, I mean, a, a way to get a lot of opportunity for life. It's uh, quite different to be in the desert, you understand? So when I, 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 from my experience, I eat a lot of plants, that's it. So from my childhood. So when I, you are in a forest, you can't find anything you can eat. Drinking is real when you are in a forest. Yeah, some plants, you take them, you mash them, you drink some other the, 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 the liquid from the plants. Actually, it's one of my, my real experience, my personal experience in the forest. I know how to feed myself in the forest. And... From there, you know, those, those emotions, until now, I still carry them that 
the forest is very important for anyone, mostly for those who are fleeing the war. They can hide inside, they can hide inside, they can find food inside, they can, yeah, they can survive actually. Um, you know, how, how long after that was it that you were reunited with your family and, and where were you reunited with your family? Yeah, I remember it was 2007 and six actually, uh, where I had to find one of my brothers. So because I fled around 2003, and uh, after three years alone in Goma, I mean Goma is one of the border town bordering Rwanda. Um, so I had to survive by, by, by myself in the city, find, trying to connect with friends, the friends of my parents, and continue to school to go to school. So then my first brother, brother, I met him in 2006 after three years. And then my parents around 2009 after five or six years uh, alone. So I, I, actually my life, I'm always alone. And I, I, I don't regret that. It's, it was a way to the success. And I really liked that experience. Did, did in the intervening period, did you know that your parents were still alive or that your brother was still alive? Not really. The three first years I was disconnected, completely disconnected. And uh, when I met my brother and some friends started telling me that my, fathers and my father and my mother are back in a refugee camp in Rwanda. So I was in Goma alone, but trying to hear and to collect information there, from there and there. And I had to know after three years that they are exactly in the refugee camp, but I couldn't go back because I was already in art school. So, so it, you know, take us through kind of what happened after you were reunited then. Um, so what, what age was this? How, how old are you when you, you finally uh, met up with your parents again? Um, I was uh, about 16, 17 when I met them, 17 actually, just one, one year after meeting my brother, I had to cross because um, at 17, I had um, a student card that allowed me to cross. Then I went to visit them in a refugee camp, uh, but it was just for a short time and I had to come back to, to school. Yeah, yeah. I, I know you, you mentioned before that um, you know, you would kind of chase after tourists and you would um, help them cross the, the border uh, in a very informal capacity. H how did that morph into being, you know, a professional tour guide and then, and then starting your own tour company? Yeah, that, that's a very good question because I, 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 I am very confident to share that. It's, a, it's quite particular on me, but maybe common to everyone in his way. But on my way, I went to, I used to go to, to, to town, to downtown in Goma, to try to see what to do. And I went through a lot of jobs. I mean, it was on ground job. Um, yeah, it, it's a long, long way to say I did this and this and this. But the time I started going to the border, I was inspired by a friend who said, okay, Obed, can you please come with me to the border? You help me to carry bags, you help me to do this, you help me to... I started going there just helping, helping those friends first. Then I started going there by myself and trying to, to ask whoever is crossing, who doesn't know where, where he's going. Where are you going? Can I help you? Where are you going? Can I help you? Some, some, of, some of the people are, are even, uh, even, they don't even care, they are careless. They don't even care about you when you are trying to help them. So I couldn't give up because uh, they, there was no other option to switch background, the history to tell. It was encouraging me to find anyone who can ask me questions. I was really confident to share all, all, all of my experience. And that was the engine uh, that supported me when I started. And, um, uh, yeah, the first tourists I met, they were very, very encouraging. They were encouraging and uh, they were loving the story, actually. I was just saying, okay, I was, I'm from Virunga. I came here as a refugee and then I'm alone and I, I'm not even, people were interested, actually. They were interested in knowing until 
I remember the, the, the first couple of tourists who I, I received, they were, even we spent about 24 hours on the same topic. Like we go to eat the same topic, we go to the border, the same topic. And I was actually encouraged in that way. And that's how I learned English, just weaving, picking on the, on the street, the words, and connecting the words, using French, the Google Translator. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and until now, that, that's the same journey I'm, I'm on it now. <laughs> uh, so, Obed, you know, tell us about Kumbu Kumbu Tours. You know, how did it come about? Um, you know, what does the company offer? What types of uh, travelers actually use its services? Yes, Kumbu Kumbu Tours uh, is uh, now five years old. It's a company, a tourism company that offers safaris across the borders in Central Africa, Congo, Rwanda, and Uganda. Now we are also going to South Sudan. Yeah, it's a, uh, we, we are actually receiving all those uh, private and uh, private tourists who are coming um, private safaris or private, private trips. And uh, now 60 of them, we can say they are, yeah, we, we are targeting the American, American market. They are Americans, 60 of our clients are Americans. Uh, but also we have, uh, we can count 30%. They are coming from Europe and 10% from Asia. So actually they, we, are, we are not targeting the local the domestic tourism uh, just because um, uh, we, we've, we tried to find uh, first those who are ready, then our long-term project, we are, also trying, we are also planning to open a flagship with the domestic tourism. Yeah. yeah. So how, how can sustainable tourism help Africa? What is the, the right way of doing it? And if you want, what is the wrong way of doing it? Uh, yeah, tourism, for me, I have a, a kind of a, a, a big understanding on it because tourism has been a tool, has been a way to bring peace. Firstly, I can say in Rwanda, uh, being open to tourism, they are uh, actually changing the, 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 the local, I mean, those ideologies that are more uh, connected to the trauma. Um, so for us also, we think that tourism will change things in the Congo. As first, it, it's, it will be uh, contributing to the economy. So we have, uh, I can say we, we have uh, many young people on the street unemployed, and uh, most of them are the one joining the militians. They are the one doing poaching. So tourism is coming on the top of the, the strategies that will be really ending all those uh, negative forces. I mean, it's obviously such an incredible um, story, Obed, and, you know, how you've kind of, you know, triumphed against this, um, or these obvious adversities in terms of becoming a refugee, becoming a, a, a child soldier, being separated from your family for a, a number of years. Um, you know, how have you kind of used that experience in... Um, founding and managing Kumbu Kumbu Tours? Yes, uh, that experience uh, for me is a treasure. It's a kind of um, uh, an asset that I, I have. Because it, it, it's, it's, even here it's about, uh, it's, it, it's, I can say it's a kind of uh, a particular experience. And Kumbu Kumbu Tours, uh, I was inspired by that, uh, by that uh, start, I mean, that job I was doing at the, at, at the border, like uh, a helper, a fixer to help people to cross. And from their questions, from their concerns, I found that they have a very big package to give them a package of information because I could give information without referring to any source. I have everything in my mind. I know where I go. I know what I'm selling. And I, I connect easily with my background, with my history. And that could make them like they feel like I gave them the one, a wonderful guiding service. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't, I, I couldn't imagine that because 
I said, what am I having? I don't, I have never been at school. I don't have any kind of skill, but the experience itself showed me that the souvenir, the, mem the memorials that I still have in mind can be an asset to start a business. That's how I started Kumbu Kumbu Towards. And Kumbu Kumbu means souvenir. Yeah. And, and you certainly have yeah. your own souvenirs from those uh, very dark days, I suppose. Yeah, they, they are not only dark, on, uh, I can say, they are also, for me, I can exploit them as, a, as, a, as, as an asset, as a tool to use and sell something. Because if I, I, I could stay in a trauma and say, I need help, I need help, maybe I could not be where I am now. And that's why... I, I don't take them as a dark experience. For me, it's a very, very valuable experience. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, what a great positive note to end on then, uh, Obed. Um, you know, we will include the details of Kumbu Kumbu Tours in the uh, description below. So anybody who wants to find out about the company or book tours for yourselves can do so. Uh, but other than that, yeah, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Welcome back. Cheers. We need bye -bye. another meeting, please. Okay, bye. Wow, guys, what a fascinating story. And uh, we've got many more fascinating stories to come. We've got some great guests lined up over the next few weeks and another podcast coming very soon. Um, if you want to be informed of when our next podcast comes out, then just click subscribe. And of course, we would love for you to uh, like the video as well because it helps our ratings. Um, until then, no, goodbye.